Hi, I'm Veganism Unspur. You may remember me from such public information films as Don't Call It Swine Flu and Meat, It Does a Starving Body Good. Well, today I'm going to be taking an in-depth look at a video entitled Eating Less Meat Won't Save the Planet, Here's Why. So let's dive right in. Recently, it seems like cows can't catch a break. Okay, I already have a problem with this. He's implying that a series of recent YouTube videos which might lead one to question the wisdom of livestock farming are somehow harmful to the cows. You know, the poor cows, they can't catch a break. Like, the cows are really invested in being farmed and we risk ruining their good time by questioning the practice. It would be more accurate to say the corporations who profit from exploiting cows can't catch a break. World's smallest violin, people. Right here. This is for the shareholders at Tyson Foods. Veganism is on the rise, but getting 100% of Americans to go plant-based is unrealistic. So let's be optimistic and say we got 10% of the United States to stop eating meat. Okay, so despite the title of the video being Eating Less Meat Won't Save the Planet, within the first two minutes, our host Joseph immediately shifts the goalposts twice. First to talking about Americans only, then only 10% of Americans. Now, Americans make up just 4.25% of the world's population, and so 10% of that would be just 0.425%. So his video title should have been 0.425% of people eating less meat won't save the planet. To which I would say, well, the doy. What would be the actual reduction of the United States planet warming greenhouse gases if 33 million people went totally plant-based? To discuss this, I'm joined here with Professor of Animal Science and Air Quality Specialist at UC Davis, Dr. Frank Mitlerner. So this is a man whose entire profession is tied up with the fate of the animal agriculture industry. If nobody raises livestock anymore, nobody needs Dr. Mitt's expertise anymore. So Dr. Mitt can't pay his rent anymore. Dr. Mitt has to get a job as a masseuse at one of those seedy places down by the airport. You get the picture. I mean. Look at this stock footage of Dr. Mitt smiling while surrounded by cows. That's a completely normal thing. He was just working with the cows one day and someone happened to capture the moment on their cell phone. It's definitely not a weird staged event trying to make livestock farming seem wholesome. He definitely doesn't have a horse in this race. Now, it is of course possible that he's a steel fortress of integrity who would call out the livestock industry for its flaws even if it meant he was out of a job. So we'll give him the benefit of the doubt for now and see what he says. This is reminded me of something you said that was really surprising to me when I first heard it, that if the entirety of the U.S. was to go vegan for a year, then the, the reduction in emissions would be like... Uh, the entire U.S. going vegan would be 2.6%. So if everybody were to do a 2.6, if one-tenth of that would do it, then it would be 0.26%. Uh, that's not even measurable, okay? We are talking about changes here that are not even measurable. And take it from a person who measures these things. I measure methane on the ground. I measure it in the air. I measure it from space. I can tell you any change less than 1% is not measurable. Not measurable. The big bombshell reveal here is that if all Americans stopped eating animal products, it would only reduce total greenhouse gas emissions by 2.6%. So 10% of Americans stopping means just a 0.26% reduction. So let's take a look at the study this figure is from. Brace yourselves. Let's begin by briefly addressing the authors of the study. The first, White, is from the Department of Animal and Poultry Science at Virginia Tech. This is the same kind of vested interest we talked about in reference to Dr. Mitt. If your job is expert in animal and poultry science, that means your profession is no longer relevant if the world stops eating animals or poultry. Wait, are birds animals? Yeah, they are, right? Yeah. White got her degree in animal science from Washington State University, and I mean, look at the course page. This is giving me flashbacks. And think about the kind of selection bias that occurs before anyone even begins the course of study. If you recognize that animal farming is damaging to the environment or otherwise unethical, you're not going to enroll. And if you figure it out halfway through, you're going to drop out. Now, the second author, Hall, is from the U.S. Dairy Forage Research Center at the USDA's Agricultural Research Service. 
That's the arm of federal government whose job it is to protect the interests of US agribusiness at any cost to the public purse or indeed the public's health. So if meat producers start to struggle, the USDA will even use taxpayer money to prop them up by buying millions of dollars worth of their unwanted products and then feeding them to school children or the inmates of federal prisons. Because the livestock industry is considered too big to fail, so the USDA is certainly not who you would go for for an unbiased critique of said industry. Anyway, the long and short of the study is that they created a model of what the US would look like if everyone stopped eating animals to see where the greenhouse gas emissions dropped. And they did, by a lot. According to their estimates, agricultural greenhouse gas emissions would be reduced by 28% under a plant-based dietary model. Okay, that sounds great. Why aren't we celebrating? <laughs> First, it's worth noting that despite still being a fantastic result, it could have been better if their model wasn't so crude in a few important respects. So firstly, their projection was based on the removal of the animals from what is currently grazing land, and then, in the case of non-tillable land, nothing being done with that land. Like, America would still be full of pasture, much of which is artificially managed to ensure its suitability for livestock grazing, but it would remain empty as a museum to livestock farming. Of course, in reality, some of that land could be rewilded, perhaps even restored to woodland, which acts as a carbon sink, but there's no consideration of such possibilities explored in this model. They're basically modelling for the day after the aliens abducted all the cows and we haven't really moved on. But that's actually the stronger part of their model, because that's just failing to anticipate useful things that could be done. They also predicted nonsense unhelpful changes which would occur. You see, the tillable land that was previously devoted to livestock production was repurposed in their model, but not for anything useful. It was repurposed for growing more corn. This despite the fact that we only grow as much corn as we do now under the current system because a third of it is used for animal feed. Secondly, let's take a look at what kind of foods people would be eating in their model of a plant-based diet, shall we? So on the left here we have a meat-inclusive diet, and on the right we have the plant-based dietary model. So a few things probably jump out at you about this model. Firstly, how on earth do you draw up a plant-based dietary model without increasing the proportion of fruit and veg in the diet? Pretty much every authority on nutrition agrees that 50% of your diet should be comprised of fruit and veg, not 20%. Well, the answer, of course, is that you assume everyone eats a staggering amount of grains instead. I mean, don't get me wrong, grains are important, but practically every nutritional guide you can find recommends that only about 20% of your diet be comprised of whole grains. Who on earth is advocating for 57%? Absolutely nobody, because that would be crazy. By the way, 77% of that grain in their model is corn, so I hope you really, really like corn, because that's a lot of corn that you're going to be eating every day of your life, according to this model. The funniest part, though, is that despite what is, in my opinion, a laughably transparent attempt to create the worst possible model of a plant-based diet in terms of nutrition, according to their own data, even this version of a plant-based diet, the corn diet, still beats out a diet which includes animal source foods in nearly every respect, and by huge margins. So with the plant-based diet, you'd get almost exactly double the energy, almost triple the fiber, and more than double the protein. But despite producing this superabundance of food, the authors still state that the plant-based dietary model, quote, resulted in a greater number of deficiencies in essential nutrients. And they can do this because despite the plant-based diet blowing the animal-inclusive diet out of the water in most nutrients, as you can see from these patterned lines, there are a few nutrients which people who adhere to a plant-based diet need to supplement, like vitamin B12 and potentially vitamin D, depending on sunlight exposure. Also, they inexplicably threw up arachidonic acid, even though it's not an essential nutrient and your body makes it. They also make much less fuss about the vitamins that their meat-inclusive diet was projected to be deficient in, such as choline, vitamin K, vitamin E, and again, vitamin D. Anyway, enough about the nutritional profiles of their dietary models. Let's take a closer look at their relative emissions. And as we can see from figure five, according to the study data, the plant-based diet creates far fewer emissions relative to the animal product inclusive diet. 176.6 million metric tons fewer each year to be precise. 
Again, we should be celebrating. To put that in context, that's the equivalent of 37.4 million fewer cars on the road. And Joseph and his expert, Dr. Mitt, try to dismiss this as negligible? Really? And this is ignoring the fact that the study authors added two emission sources to plant-based dietary models, which make zero sense. First of all, there's this tiny red line in here, which represents the carbon costs associated with disposing of human inedible crop byproducts. Then there's the gray section, which represents the extra synthetic fertilizer they decided you need on a plant-based diet because you're no longer using animal manure. Of course, it wouldn't take a genius to figure out that, hey, maybe instead of disposing of the inedible plant matter and then manufacturing synthetic fertilizer, we could compost the plant matter and get organic fertilizer for free. But furthermore, we have to remember that this diet on the right produces almost exactly double the calories, double the protein and double most of the micronutrients. So in effect, it's not actually a model for feeding the US, it's a model for feeding the US twice. So it would make much more sense to half the food production and the related emissions and compare like for like. Now we're saving around 397 million metric tons of emissions each year. That's a 64% reduction in total emissions from the agricultural sector. And that's the equivalent of 71 million fewer cars on the road. This figure seems to confirm the conclusions of Paul and Nemec, who in their 2018 study estimated that people in the US switching away from animal products would result in emissions reductions of 61 to 73%. It also conforms closely to the conclusions of researchers from the University of Michigan, who in their 2020 paper projected that for the US population in 2030, reducing animal product consumption by 50% would reduce emissions by 35% or 224 million metric tons. And so doubling that for a completely plant-based scenario, we get 70% reductions totaling 448 million metric tons. So yeah, I pretty much nailed it with those adjusted calculations. It seems that the USA adopting a plant-based diet is likely to reduce greenhouse gas emissions as CO2 equivalent by 60 to 70% or around 400 million metric tons per year. So returning at last to the video, when citing this study, you may recall that Joseph and Dr. Mitt don't express the projections for emissions reductions achievable on a plant-based diet in terms of CO2 equivalent savings, nor as a percentage reduction of all agricultural emissions, which according to the original interpretation of Hall and White would have been 28% reduction. No, they didn't do that because that still sounds too high. So instead, they expressed the emissions reductions as a percentage of total emissions from all sectors which by their calculations meant a 2.6% reduction. But assuming you're not growing double the food when compared to the animal inclusive model for no reason, would actually be more like 5.7%. But that still doesn't sound super impressive, does it? And presumably that's the point. Expressing it in this way would make pretty much any conceivable change seem meaningless because the absolute ceiling on their figure for reductions is 9%, because back in 2010, emissions from agricultural sources were estimated to account for 9% of total US emissions by the EPA. Now, there's good evidence that this 9% figure seriously underestimates the impact of methane emissions from livestock, so go watch Mike the Vegan's excellent video on the topic to get the lowdown on that. But even if we take the EPA's 9% figure at face value, that's still a huge chunk of the country's emissions. Yet, even if you devised a magical agricultural system in which no emissions were produced whilst feeding the entire population of the US, it still wouldn't look very impressive on their little graphic because it would still be only a 9% total reduction and they'd still do their bit about, well, what if only 10% of the population wanted to stop climate change, then it would only be a 0.9% reduction. And so they'd still get to say that this effect is so small that the difference couldn't be measured. In other words, the way they're presenting the data makes it literally inevitable that the reduction looks like a negligible difference, though it's anything but. To further illustrate my point, according to the EPA, the US produces 6,558 million metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions as CO2 equivalent each year, of which the transportation sector in its entirety accounts for around 29%, or 1,875 million metric tons. Now, obviously these emissions can be subdivided further into emissions from road vehicles, rail, marine vehicles, and aviation. So let's take aviation. Domestic flights within the US happen to account for 178.5 million metric tons of emissions every year. 
that's 9.5% of all emissions from transportation, and hence 2.7% of total US emissions. So Joseph and Dr. Mitt, or Joseph and some scientist who's chummy with the aviation industry, could equally have made a graphic saying that if 100% of Americans gave up domestic air travel, it would only reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 2.7%, and if 10% gave it up, the difference would be 0.27%, a difference so small it couldn't be measured. So follow this link for 10% of flights to Hawaii, nothing you do matters. The point is, there's no one solution to climate change, there's no magic bullet. We're going to have to make progress towards emissions reductions in every sector simultaneously. And that's how you save the world. 60 to 70% of 10% at a time. So the water input that people assign to beef includes, and that's the majority, the so-called green water. And the green water is rainwater. That rainwater would fall on that land where the animals graze with cattle present and without cattle present. There's so much wrong with this. Basically, Dr. Mitt is saying it's okay that the water footprint of beef production is so high because the water that falls in pasture land and on the cow's feed crops comes from the sky. And it would fall from the sky even if the cows weren't there or even if the crops weren't there. I mean, yes, of course it would fall from the sky anyway, but what we're interested in is how we best make use of that water after it falls from the sky. He also seems to be suggesting that we separate out the water resources that go into the land that's required to support the cows from the water content of their bodies and only use that figure to talk about the water requirements of beef production as if cow flesh was grown without context, without a cow and without cows needing pasture land to graze on or feed crops to be grown to support them. Of course, we need to measure the water footprint of the agricultural system that produces beef not just the water content of a T-bone. And the information that's presented on screen right now is just plain wrong because they label this as a typical cow. But Hoekstra and McConnon, the authors of the study cited, actually categorize animals raised for beef into three production systems, grazing, mixed production systems, and industrialized production systems. And so this 94% figure refers to grazing cattle specifically, not the typical cow, especially since approximately 90% of all beef in the US actually comes from mixed or industrialized beef farming, for which the figures are very different. However, the authors of the study do say that fresh water problems generally relate to blue water scarcity and water pollution, and to a lesser extent, to competition over green water. And so it could be argued that it's better for a system of production to be reliant on a higher proportion of green water than blue water, for example, but it's also true in the case of beef production that grazing systems actually make the least efficient use of water and have the largest water footprint overall relative to other production methods. And so, as you can see from this table, to produce a ton of beef requires 20,217 cubic meters of water using a grazing-based production system, 14,040 cubic meters of water using mixed production system, and 3,856 cubic meters of water in an industrialized production system. This is because, as the study authors explain, about three to four times more feed is required for grazing systems when compared to industrial systems. More feed implies that more water is needed to produce that feed. Hence, because the total volume of water used to produce beef under a grazing-based production system is so much higher, even though the proportions of blue and gray water it uses is smaller, if we look at the raw data on the volume of water used, grazing-based production systems actually require about the same amount of blue water and grey water as the other systems per ton of beef produced. And so, referring to just the proportion of green water required in grazing production systems in order to make beef production seem like it has a low water footprint is extremely misleading. Not only does the green water footprint still very much matter because we could still put that rainwater to better, more efficient uses, but the blue water footprint and grey water footprint actually are still incredibly high in terms of the actual volume of water monopolized. As the authors of the study make clear, it's more water efficient to obtain calories, protein and fat through crop-based products than animal products. And they ultimately warn that the rising global meat consumption and the intensification of animal production systems will put further pressure on global fresh water resources in the coming decades. So how do you read this study and then reference this study to support the assertion that the water footprint of beef production isn't a problem because rain? 
And guess what happens to that water a few hours after it's ingested? It's urinated out. It's not staying in the animal. It stays in the animal as long as the tea that you drank this morning stayed into your body or inside your body. Ah, oh, this is the most absurd part of the video yet. When watching this, I felt like I'd been transported into a Lewis Carroll novel. So first he tried to downplay the water footprint of beef. And now, I guess, just in case that didn't land, in, in case someone reads the study he cited, he now sets up his safety net, which consists of suggesting that the water footprint of the agricultural system which produces beef is irrelevant anyway, because every droplet of water needed to maintain that system will one day pass through it and enter back into the water table. That's great news, isn't it? That means that we can just grow an infinite number of cows and people, because whatever water is in their bodies, they'll eventually excrete. Obviously, this is nonsense. This is the whole reason we have a measure that we call a water footprint or virtual water, and it's a measure of how much water is tied up in any given system at any given time. Water is a finite resource. If there's 100,000 cubic meters of water tied up in beef agriculture, which doesn't just include what's actually in a cow's bladder at any given time, by the way, but if there's 100,000 cubic meters tied up in beef agriculture, then that's 100,000 cubic meters of water that cannot be put to any other use. But Dr. Mitt speaks as though, hey, someone else can just have the water once we're done with it, once the cows urinate it out, apparently misunderstanding how both virtual water calculations and time works. This is one guy you really don't want to be stuck on a desert island with. Dr. Mitt, what happened to our last bottle of water? Oh, I drank it, my good man. But do not worry. In a few hours, I shall urinate it out and we can drink it again. Huzzah for my PhD in animal science. Can you imagine if that was how water management worked, though? It would be a scheduling nightmare. Okay, so beef industry gets the water Mondays. Then once the cows peed out, corn growers, you can have it on Tuesdays. Wednesdays, thermoelectric power, yeah, and then Thursdays, the public can take a bath. You know what? That's actually perfect because uh, the water's still going to be warm from the power plants. We are nailing it, guys. So to me, it is disingenuous to say, oh, look at all that water that grows that goes into, into growing cattle. Would we say the same thing about all the water that goes to trees to grow? Of course not. Of course we would, pardon the pun, and do, again, because we need to if we want to understand and then manage our water use. So yes, we measure the water footprint of trees, just like everything else. Here's a scientific paper which does just that. Because whilst it's true that every droplet of water absorbed by every tree will eventually pass back into the water table through percolation or transpiration, since we all exist at the same point in time, that doesn't mean that infinite people can use that same tree water to take infinite baths with infinite rubber duckies. Also, consider that nutritionists don't just say, a human needs precisely two pounds of general food material per day. There's a full course meal, donuts and coffee. We need to think about nutritional requirements when we eat. And beef is way more nutrient dense, so yeah, 122 liters used to make a quarter pound of beef is not nothing. But you can't compare that to a quarter pound of rice. Well, apparently you can compare the two. Don't get me wrong, you really shouldn't compare them because that makes no sense. But you did. Why did you do that? Is anybody suggesting that we stop producing beef and replace the beef in our diets with white rice? Obviously not. This video has descended into farce. By the way, these figures for water requirements at the top are way off, because even though he never explicitly states as much, he's decided not to count green water. I think it has something to do with his comments earlier about how cows urinate so green water shouldn't count. So now he's literally not counting it. This, despite the fact that the researchers whose study he cited in order to ostensibly back up his ideas about green water, very much do include green water figures in their own calculations of the water cost of beef production. So if we weren't pretending that rainwater isn't an important resource to be included in these calculations, if we were actually following the guidelines of the experts whose studies we're supposedly using to back up our positions, then this figure for the water cost of producing 200 grams of cooked beef would actually be 3,700 liters. Again, this is if we actually use the data from the people who calculate water footprints for a living. No, more than that. 
from the people who actually invented the universal standards within science for calculating water footprints. Hoekstra and McConnell literally wrote the manual on calculating water footprints, and they of course include green water in their calculations. Yet, Joseph and Dr. Mitt tell a little story about how if a cow pees in a rainstorm nobody notices, and then they think they know better? The arrogance. So we're going to fix this. First, we're going to compare gram for gram, the nutritional content of beef, with an actual substitute, lentils. Then, we're going to go one step further and compare how much nutritional bang you get for your water buck on a liter for liter basis. Now, for the data on the water footprint required to produce 100 grams of each food, I'm going to lift the values straight out of the McConnell and Hoekstra study. These values are global averages for the production of pulses of all kinds, as well as beef across all three production scenarios. For nutrient and micronutrient values, I'm going to be using chronometer, and since you can't just input beef or pulses, I'll be using the values for boiled lentils and beef sirloin steak with no fat removed. Both of these nutrient profiles come from the Nutrition Coordinating Center Food and Nutrition Database, or NCCDB, which is curated by the University of Minnesota. Here are the results. So, first of all, we see that it takes 1,850 liters of water to make 100 grams of cooked beef, whereas it only takes 140 liters to make the same weight in cooked lentils. Ah, I hear you say, but surely beef will be at least 10 times more nutritious. And the answer is no. Heck, that wasn't even true of white rice. So here are the results. There's a lot to take in, so let's cover the most important bases. The 100 grams of beef provides you with 160, 60 calories, whereas the lentils provide 116. When it comes to protein, the beef provides about 30 grams and the lentils provide 9 grams. In terms of carbohydrates, you get 20 grams with the lentils and 0 grams with beef. Similarly, the lentils provide around 6 grams of fiber, whereas the beef gives you 0. In terms of vitamins, the lentils provide you with a good chunk of folate, but nothing else above 15% of one's RDI, whereas the beef gives you no folate, but high numbers for many of the B vitamins, including B12, B6, and B3. In terms of mineral content, it may be surprising that the lentils beat out beef in terms of iron content, but overall, values are higher for beef in most respects. Certainly a strong case could be made that beef is the victor here. It provides more calories and more of most nutrients per gram. However, it does bear highlighting that you're also taking in 77 milligrams of cholesterol with the beef and none with the lentils. Similarly, the beef contains trans fats where the lentils don't and beef is also much higher in saturated fat. With these results in mind, now it's time for the real test, to compare the efficiency of either growing lentils or raising cattle for beef in terms of how many nutrients you get out for the water you put in. So, assuming you invest 1,000 litres of water into a farming system, these are the results you can expect. So, these were the results based on my original calculations, but a few people pointed out, hey, wouldn't the water footprint data likely be for dried lentils, yet you're using the nutritional values for cooked? So I checked, and they were right. Hence, why the study authors asserted that a kilogram of pulses provided 3,412 calories. You need almost 3 kilograms of cooked lentils to get this many calories, but that makes complete sense given that the cooked weight of lentils is about 2.9 times the dry weight. So I'd basically undersold the nutritional value of lentils by a factor of 2.9, and didn't even notice because they still ended up looking way better than the figures for beef. But this also got me to thinking, I'm doing the same thing on the other side of the equation. I'm using the water footprint data for a given weight of raw beef output, then using the nutritional data for cooked beef. In this case, this actually oversold beef's nutritional value. This is because when you cook meat, it loses much of its weight. The weight you end up with after cooking is what the USDA refers to as the cooking yield percentage. And for beef products, that figure ranges from a low of 53% to a high of 86%. Sirloin steak, for example, which I used in my original calculation, has a cooking yield of 80%. In other words, it loses 20% of its weight relative to the raw product. So, when I first analyzed the nutritional profile of 100 grams of sirloin steak, I failed to account for the fact that this 100 grams of cooked meat requires that you begin with 120 grams of raw meat. And so, I essentially undercalculated its water footprint by 20%. So, with all that in mind, let's take a look at the new, even more shocking results. As you can see, when you properly account for water requirements, it completely flips the script. 
now lentils blow beef out of the water, if you'll excuse the pun, providing almost exactly 10 times the calories at 827 versus just 83 for beef. The lentils also produce more than four times the protein at 64.3 grams compared to just 15.5 grams for beef. When it comes to carbohydrates and fiber, of course, the beef still gives you nothing, whilst the lentils provide 143 grams and 41 grams, respectively. Lentils also provide more of every single vitamin, as well as giving you 91% of your needed vitamin B5, 98% of your B6, all of your required B1, and more than triple your needed folate. When it comes to minerals, the picture's even better. The highest numbers you're getting out of beef are 26% for selenium, whereas the lentils provide more of everything, save salt, and even provide double and triple your requirements for certain minerals. In short, getting your nutrition from lentils is the far more water-efficient option. I mean, it's not even close. This is the data we should have been shown. The data one needs to see in order to form an educated opinion about the relative water use efficiency of plant-based foods and beef. Instead, what did we get? We got this, a gram for gram comparison of beef and white rice, in which water requirements were a footnote and a manipulated footnote at that, since green water costs were erased. So in the end, do you know what I've learned from this whole affair? I learned that people love to hear good news about their bad habits and that it's frighteningly easy to be misled by a guy with a PhD and some fancy animations. <laughs>